Welcome to the Thrive Church Online. We're so happy that you've joined us. Whether you're at home or maybe uh, commuting to work, we're so glad that you joined us. And, you know, it's it's so easy to be able to invite somebody to come to church when you're watching online. So go ahead and share this post or tag somebody that you'd like to watch it with. But um, it's a great thing to be able to come together and worship God, even if we can't all be together. So if you're at the comfort of your home, if you're in the living room, maybe turn it up a little bit. But we can worship God in spirit and in truth and in separate rooms too. So we just invite you to join us.
has walked upon the open waters. The sea was calm with just a word from him. He has fought the raging war of sorrow. When he speaks, a whisper shouts within. I see. Jesus Christ, passion is his name. He traded all his glory for our shame like he rose.
God, we thank you that, that we can turn to you in any time of need, Father. That you listen to our cry, that you are listening to our prayers. Father, I thank you that you are not any less powerful in a time like this, that, that during this time, Lord, that we can put our trust in you, that we can put our hope in you, knowing that your plans are still good for us. God, I pray for our country, I pray for unity, I pray for healing, I pray for a work that only you can do. That at this time, that this would only draw more and more people closer to you to recognize that you are a father who deeply loves them. Would you reveal yourself to us today? Reveal yourself, reveal your heart, reveal your vision for our lives, God. We know that you are still capable of doing miracles and, and we declare that now, that we will see a miracle. We will see chains broken. We will see lives changed and let it be all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, welcome everybody to Thrive Church Online. This is our second week of online church um, and we want to welcome you here. My name is Matt Carlack, and I'm one of the pastors here at Thrive, and we want to thank you so much for coming. If this is your first time tuning in with us, or if you're new to tuning in here at Thrive Church, uh, we ask that you go to thrive.church info, and if you put your information there, someone's going to reach out to you and say hello. We do promise we're not going to show up at your door. We won't go and shake your hand because we got to keep these hands clean. Um, also, if you are used to giving here at the church in one of the offering boxes in the back, you could go to thrive.church slash give, and you could give your donations there. And I hope you're all comfortable. I hope that you could go and invite some of your friends along, maybe hop on Facebook and say, hey, we're having church right now, and, and join in together with us as we worship God together and as we learn about forgiveness and what Jesus did for us. And God bless you all. Thrive Church Online. We are so excited to have you joining with us. I'm Judah, lead pastor here of Thrive Church, and normally we meet in two locations, but last week we had the opportunity to meet in 1,282 locations. That's right, we've been meeting all across uh, Connecticut in people's homes and in their work and in their car, and we are so honored to have you joining with us as we worship God. You know, this country is going through some crazy things right now, but we are excited that God is still on the throne, that he is still in control. He has not lost control for a moment, and we don't need to live in fear, but we can live in faith knowing that Jesus is the king. So we welcome you, and we're so thankful that you're here, and we are praying for you. We're praying for your health, and we're praying for your safety of you and your loved ones. And we are beginning a brand new series this week called Last Words. Last Words. You know, when, when you think about someone's last words, they tend to have special significance, don't they? You know, we, we call them the famous last words because it tends to, to encapsulate someone's life. When someone is on their deathbed, they don't really have much to lose, so they'll kind of speak their mind. They'll speak what's really on their heart. It, it kind of sums up their life. Uh, here's some, some famous last words from some famous people. Nostradamus, he predicted, tomorrow at sunrise I shall no longer be here, and he was right. Uh, Michael Landon, famous actor from Little House on the Prairie, he had his family around as he was dying from cancer, and his son said it was time to move on, and Landon said, you're right, it's time, and I love you all. John Wayne, who died at age 72 in L.A., he turned to his wife and said, of course I know who you are. You're my girl, and I love you. Bob Marley said, money can't buy life. Well, I, I'm from the South, so they say that a redneck's famous last words is, hold my beer and watch this. Um, you know, we all have, you know, things. We've heard people, their famous last words, but the last words we're gonna be talking about in this series are the last words of Jesus Christ. 
And, and he had to endure some, some atrocious things. His back was whipped. He was beaten. In fact, they say that how he was whipped, if they whipped a person 40 times, they would die, so they'd only whip them 39 times. Jesus' back was whipped. And then he was forced to carry his cross. And, and, and he carried his cross, and, and they hung him up on this cross to die. And as he was there, he spoke some words. He spoke words that are, that are important to us today. He had seven things that he said, and throughout this series, we're gonna be taking a look at some of the things that he said as he's hanging there on the cross. And he's hanging there with these nails that are going through his wrists and going through his feet. And, and, and he can't breathe, and the only way for him to breathe is to push on the nails and lift himself up to, to, to get a breath of air and to, and to utter some words. So the things that he said in the last moments of his life have great significance to us as followers of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 23, we see the first thing that he said. It says, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. So here he is. He's just been nailed to this cross and, and been lifted up for everyone to see. His body is in agony, and he's looking upon the people who have just done this horrible thing to him. And the criminals were also crucified. It says, one on his right and one on his left. In verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Them, who, who is this them that he's referring to? Father, forgive them, who is this? Well, he spoke this out to the, to the soldiers, the very ones who moments earlier had whipped his back, who had beaten a crown of thorns on his head, who ripped his beard out, who, who nailed him to a cross, who spit on him and mocked him. And he's looking at them and saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He was speaking to the religious leaders who had falsely accused him and condemned him to die. But also, he was speaking to me and to you. You know, I doubt these Roman soldiers had ever heard anything like this before. They had nailed literally tens of thousands of people to the cross. They, they, they nailed people all the time, and, and I'm sure they would often hear people swearing at them, begging them for mercy, crying out in agony. But I, I bet never once had they heard the person who was hanging on the cross say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, each of us played a part in nailing Jesus to the cross. You know, all of our sins were heaped on Jesus, and he received the punishment that we all deserve because our sins separated us from God. And Jesus took those sins upon himself. And as he's there, as he's looking at the Roman soldiers, as he's looking at the religious leaders, as he's looking at the passers-by, he's also looking through time at you and at me and saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus used his last breaths to say, Father, forgive them. And this is at the heart of the gospel. This is why it's the good news, because Jesus, who came down from heaven, who lived a sinless life, in the last moments, he took our sin upon him. He said, Father, forgive them. I don't know about you, but that, that doesn't tend to be my first response when somebody does something wrong to me. If they do something wrong to me, I'm not usually saying, God, will you please forgive them. For example, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. They don't use their blinker. They, they just cut you off in traffic. And, and what is our first reaction? Oh, Father, please forgive them. Like, like, like that's not our first reaction usually. What's our first reaction? Like, like you know, uh, God, let there be a cop right around the corner or, 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 or let, let them run over a bunch of nails and get four flat tires. No, five flat tires. Let their spare be flat also. Like, like we don't want them to be forgiven. If you were Jesus, or if I was Jesus hanging on the cross, what would your last words be? Father, judge them. Judge them. Or maybe be like, hey guys, in three days, I'll be back, and I'm coming for you. Like, I I'm gonna get you when I get down off of this thing. No, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Who is he forgiving? He's forgiving murderers at that moment. 
Many people think that the murder is probably one of the, the worst crimes that we can commit against somebody. And in this moment, Jesus is not only forgiving murderers, he's forgiving his murderers, the people who are doing this crime against him. Jesus forgiving murderers. One of my friends many years ago was going through some tragedy in his life and, and his anger took a wrong turn and he did things that he should have never done and he ended up killing his wife. It was a horrible thing that he did and, and nobody can justify what he did. And he went to prison and he's still there and I go and visit him from time to time. But let me tell you, Jesus Christ has forgiven him of his sins because he confessed, he came to God and, and he came with humility. And Jesus says, Father, forgive him because he doesn't know what he's doing. See, this forgiveness God is offering to you and he's offering it to me. In your notes, if you're taking them, see, sin is strong, but Jesus is stronger. Sin is strong. Yes, we, we need to admit that sin is strong, but Jesus Christ is stronger than any sin. Jesus Christ is stronger. Jesus Christ is the only one who ever could defeat sin. Jesus is the only one that could defeat death. People are amazed at the fact that Jesus defeated death and he came back to life again, but I think that that wasn't the most amazing part of this story. It wasn't that he defeated death, but it was that he defeated sin. See, because Jesus is stronger than any sin. See, and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. It kind of seemed like they did know what they were doing though. Like they're nailing him to the cross. They're crucifying him. They're executing him so everyone can see. It kind of seemed like they knew what they were doing. But Jesus said, no, you, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know. You don't know what you're doing. Have you ever tried to do something and you didn't know what you were doing? I did this many years ago. I went to Hawaii. And uh, while we were there in Hawaii, I decided I was gonna go surfing. And I figured it looked fun and, and, and I used to skateboard, so how much different could it be? So, so I went out and I rented a skateboard and they're like, would you like a lesson with that? I'm like, no, I don't need a lesson with that. Why would I need a lesson with that? So I went out and I proceeded uh, to spend hours trying to figure out how to surf on my own. Needless to say, I never got up on the surfboard, but even worse than that, I didn't realize that most surfers that know what they're doing wear something called a surf shirt over their body because the top of the surfboard is essentially like sandpaper. I didn't realize this until after and I basically rubbed the skin off of my chest because I had no clue what I was doing out there. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. You might think that, that what you're doing seems pleasurable, but he's saying, no, you don't know what you're doing. See, we all face a pandemic in life, not a pandemic of a disease, but a pandemic of sin. Sin that's coming to Adam and Eve, when they sinned that first time, they didn't know what they were doing. It just seemed like a little disobedience. They didn't know what they were doing, that they were opening up their lives to sin and to death. As scripture says in Romans 6, it says that the wages of sin is death. See, it doesn't say the wages of sin is, is sad. Or, or the wages of sin is, it's really unfortunate. Or the wages of sin is inconvenient. Or perhaps the, the wages of sin is, is just kind of, you know, it's a bother. No, it says the wages of our sin is death. The payment that we get, what we deserve for our sin is death and eternal separation from God. You might feel like, well, how, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem just. I haven't sinned as much as somebody else has. I mean, some people have sinned way more. You know, I've never killed anybody before. So I haven't sinned as much as other people. How much sin is too much sin? Let, let, me, let me rephrase that because of the world that we're living in now with this coronavirus going on, how much virus do you need to contaminate your body? See, this is something that we can't see. And, and just a little bit comes in and it begins to multiply and it begins to, to, to make us sick. Sin is, is far worse than that. See, even just a little bit, it begins to multiply and it gets into our heart. See, the wages of our sin is death. It says in Romans 3, 23, for everyone, everyone, that means you, and this means me, everyone has sinned. And we all fall short of God's glorious standard. I don't need to convince you of this. You know this already. You know that you've done things that, that displease God. I know that I certainly have. We've all sinned. We've all 
fallen short of God's standard. We couldn't make it. We can't get there on our own. We've all been proven guilty. We've all been proven to be sinners. And if you don't believe me, some people say, oh, we're all born innocent until you have kids and then you realize that that's not true, right? Like I have four kids whom I love dearly. I love dearly, but let me tell you, they are all sinners. Like they, they all came into this world. We didn't teach them how to do this. They did, people say, oh, your kids are so sweet. Yeah, they, they are sweet little sinners. And so am I, because this is something that we were all born with. This is the sin nature that we have in us. It says, for all of us have sinned and we all fall short of God's standard. And what Jesus did on the cross is he's hanging by these nails. He's hanging there. The nails representing our sin, holding us there. He chose to be there, and he's gathering all the sin of the world. He's gathering your sin and my sin. He's gathering the Roman soldier's sin. He's gathering the sin of everybody. All of humanity is gathering that upon himself of every nationality, every race, every person. He's gathering that sin. It's like on a computer selecting, you know, command A or control A, select all. I'm gonna select all the sin and bring it on to me. And Jesus says, and I am still stronger than your sin. Your sin may be strong, but I am stronger still. Your sin may have a hold on you, but I am the only one who can defeat sin. Because in your notes, there is no sin too big to be forgiven. See, God wants to forgive your sin. There is no sin that is too big to be forgiven by God. There is no past that is too soiled to be cleaned up. There is no sinner who is too bad to be redeemed. See, sin is strong, yes, but Jesus Christ is stronger. He's stronger than all of our sin. He's stronger than all of these things put together. Jesus Christ is stronger. His forgiveness is complete. Your past, it may bother you, but Jesus says, I am stronger than that. I can break you free from these things that hold you back, that trip you up. Have you ever done something and you needed to be forgiven of it? Maybe you hurt somebody, you cheated somebody, you lied, you stole, you did something and you needed to experience forgiveness. Jesus is offering forgiveness to you today. He's offering forgiveness to me today. Many people say that all the religions in the world are the same. Well, they're not. See, this is what sets them all apart. See, it's this idea, this concept of forgiveness that there is a loving God who willingly paid the price for our sin and forgives us of our sin. See, most of the world religions have this idea of karma, right? This idea of of what goes around comes around. What I do to somebody else is what's gonna come and happen to me as well. This idea of karma, it's all just gonna come back around all these world religions. And and so what they have to do is they have to to somehow pay for their sin. They have to do, do penance. They have to to, to hurt themselves. They have to offer sacrifices, perhaps. Some cultures, if they they see someone doing something inappropriate, a a woman showing her ankle, then then they they beat her because they're saying, you've sinned and you have to pay the price. But Jesus alone, he interrupts karma and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He interrupts this vicious cycle of what goes around comes around. He says, no, what goes around stops with me. It stops at the cross. It stops with the blood of Jesus, which is shed for our forgiveness. It says in Acts 4, verse 12, it says, there is salvation in no one else. See, if we believe what scripture says is true, then we have to believe what it says here. There is salvation in no one else. There is forgiveness in no one else. There is no other name that we can be saved. It says God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the one who stopped the vicious cycle of sin. He is the one who set us free from death. He is the one who stops this cycle of karma. What goes around doesn't have to come around when Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. See, no other world religion has a God who forgives his enemies. No other world religion has this. Instead, they believe that their God wants to strike down their enemies but not our God, not Jesus Christ. Instead of striking his enemies down, he says, let me take your place. Let me take your place. Let me take your sin. Let me take the evil that you've done and I will put it on me. This is radical forgiveness. It's radical forgiveness for Jesus to be on the cross and in that moment to look the killers in the eye and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
In that moment, they thought they knew what they were doing, but they did not realize that their actions were actually separating them from God. They thought they were doing their job. They thought they were simply executing another criminal. But no, they were separating themselves from God. And each of us, whenever we sin, we're doing the same thing. We're separating ourselves from God. And Jesus is saying to God the Father, says, Father, please forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. This is radical forgiveness. See, God's goal was not to to judge and execute his enemies. His goal was to love them because we serve a God of radical forgiveness. We serve a God who radically forgives everyone and in return, he wants us to do the same. In your notes, we need to be people of radical forgiveness as well. We need to be showing people forgiveness in our world. And and this uh, can be very difficult for some of us to do. Because maybe you've been hurt by somebody before. Maybe somebody's let you down in your life. Maybe you feel like somebody has betrayed you. Maybe you've had a conflict with somebody that's still not to be resolved. And and we're sitting there thinking, oh, maybe things will get right when they come to me, when they take the first step. Maybe somebody has hurt you deeply. Maybe it's even been many, many years ago and you're experiencing that hurt and, and we've, been, we've been pierced. We have these, these nails and some, some are big and some are small, but, but we have this hurt in our life and we feel somebody deserves to be punished. And maybe in fact they do. But this person may deserve punishment, but what they truly need is forgiveness just like me and you. In your notes, we all deserve punishment, but what we need is forgiveness. See, I deserve punishment. I deserve eternal separation from God, but what I need is I need forgiveness. I need Jesus to look at me and say, Father, forgive him, because he didn't know what he was doing. Father, forgive him. Father, forgive them for what they've done. Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And we're all carrying hurts all different kinds of hurts. Maybe you've got different sizes of hurts. We have some big hurts, some medium-sized hurts, some small hurts. We we have sin in our life, these things that that, that pierce us deeply. And these things are, 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 are wounding us. And we think of this person who's caused us this pain. Imagine hanging on that cross and looking at the people who caused, caused you this pain and saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. But instead, we often want to just get them back. We, we don't want to forgive them. They've caused us too much pain. My heart has been pierced. My body has been pierced with so many sorrows. But if we don't forgive, and if we don't turn this over to God, it becomes infected. And this infection will end up destroying our lives. It says in Colossians chapter three, Verse 13, it says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Who do we forgive? Anyone who forgives you, uh, who, who offends you. We need to forgive anyone. It goes on to say, in case you didn't catch it the first time, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others as the Lord forgave. You must, this is not an option. This is not open for discussion. This is not open for debate. Scripture is saying that if you have received God's forgiveness in your life, you need to extend that forgiveness to the the person, the people that have hurt you and caused you pain in your life. We need to forgive them. See, forgiveness is powerful. And we have a perfect example to follow. We have a perfect example of Jesus Christ who hung on the cross, naked, experienced shame, was being mocked, who was being spit upon, was being beat, He was bruised for us and he's hanging there and he's saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. If we have been forgiven, can't we extend that forgiveness to someone else? You know, I I get it. It's not natural for us to forgive. It's not natural, but it's a supernatural thing. When God's forgiveness flows through us, when we receive God's forgiveness into our life, now it becomes possible for us to extend that forgiveness to other people. He has given us the example to follow and God wants us to forgive. See, when we forgive someone, we think that it just lets them off the hook. But see, really what it does is when you forgive somebody, it sets you free because maybe you're holding on to this thing 
and it's dragging you down. And I'm like, I can't let go of it. I can't let go of it. But it's an anchor that's dragging you down and you can't breathe because you're under the water and this anchor keeps dragging you down. And, and God's saying, why don't you let go of it? Let go of this bitterness. Let go of this anger. Let go of this thing that happened to you. Somebody said that, that unforgiveness is like lighting yourself on fire and hoping somebody else dies of smoke inhalation. Right, like, like it just doesn't make sense. You're the one who suffers when you don't forgive somebody. You're the one who, who ends up living in anguish because you have not let go, because you have not forgiven someone that God has wanted you to forgive. In your notes, at some point, we need to stop just believing in the cross and we need to take up the cross. See, it's important for us to believe in the cross, yes. Because in the cross, that is where we find our forgiveness. That's where we find healing and we find hope. But at some point in time, See, Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must take up your cross and follow me. See, it's that transition from believing in the cross, from putting my faith in Jesus Christ on the cross, from believing in the cross and saying, now I'm going to take up my cross. And now I'm gonna be the one who says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive that person who hurt me. Father, forgive that person who abused me. Father, forgive that person who did wrong to me. Father, forgive that person who broke my heart. Father, forgive that person who cheated me. They didn't know what they were doing. This is radical forgiveness. Jesus demonstrated that. And then we see shortly thereafter, a man named Stephen. And Stephen experienced this very same thing. Stephen, he was preaching the gospel and he got criticized and they drug him out into the streets and they began to stone him. They took big stones like this and people are throwing them at him and they're hitting his body. And the punishment was they were gonna stone him until he died. This is brutal, a brutal way to die. And Stephen is being stoned, he's being pummeled by these stones. And guess what Stephen says? He says, Father, forgive them. Don't put this sin on them. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Please forgive them. But see, us expressing forgiveness to others, it begins with me realizing that I have been forgiven, that somebody paid the price for me, that somebody paid my debt. Not too long ago, I went out for pizza with some friends. And as we were there, we were having a good time. We're, we're eating the pizza, we're, we're chatting. And then we get up and we say, you know, hey, why don't you bring the bill? And they say, sorry, you can't pay the bill. We're like, what do you mean we can't pay the bill? Because you can't pay the bill. The bill has already been paid for you. Somebody else in the restaurant saw us and they, and they picked up the check and they paid the bill for us. There was no amount of money that I could pay at that point to pay for the bill that had already been paid. See, sin is strong, but Jesus is stronger. Sin has made a debt that we could not pay, and Jesus is saying, I will be the one who pays the debt. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So somebody needs to hear this today. Somebody needs to hear this, that you are free, that you are released, that you are forgiven, that God wants to offer you a new life and freedom today. But it starts with, calling out on the name of Jesus. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, it says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. See, you're guilty and I'm guilty. We're guilty of sin. We're guilty of a debt that we could not pay, but God's word is true. God's word stands the test of time. That he says, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. In your notes, forgiveness is the most amazing miracle that we can ever experience. Many people, they want a miracle in their life. They want a healing in their life. They want a financial breakthrough in their life. They want a spouse. They want all these things, and those things are good, and keep praying for them. But the most amazing miracle that you can ever experience in your life is not a physical healing, but it's a spiritual healing. It's Jesus Christ forgiving your sins and making you right with God. This is something that no other religion in the world can offer you, the ability to be in right standing, right relationship with God through the sacrifice that Jesus made. Because in that moment, as Jesus was hanging on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wipes the slate clean. 
He wipes all of your sin, your past, your shame. He wipes it clean and he offers you forgiveness. And he said, well, I want you to come into my family. And all we need to do is we need to call out on him. No matter what you've done, he says, I want to forgive you. No matter your past, he says, I want to forgive you. You are forgiven. No matter your shame, you are forgiven. No matter your sin, he's saying, Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. And even though your sin seemed pleasurable at the time, it seemed right. Scripture says there's a way that seems right, but it ends in death. And we didn't realize that it was actually separating us from God. We didn't realize that it was keeping us out of God's presence. And as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he forgave you and he forgave me. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they were doing. And he set you free and he paid the price for you. He says, you are forgiven and he is an awesome God and he made a way for you. And sin is strong, but Jesus is stronger. Your past may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. Your shame may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. And he made a way for you. He made a way that you could be right with God. He made a way that you could be forgiven. And as he's on that cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now and we thank you that you made a way for us. That you made a way where there was no way. There was no way for us to, to clean the spot of sin in our life. But we thank you for those final words that Jesus said, wiping the slate clean once and for all as he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Today, if you've not made a commitment to Christ, don't let another day go by. Wherever you are, in your home, in your car, at work, wherever you are, don't let another day go by. Jesus says, anyone who calls on my name will be saved. If we believe that, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Jesus from the dead, so he didn't stay dead on a cross, but he's alive and he's living. He's broken the bondage of sin. And won't you call on his name today and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. Father, we call on your name now. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for giving us a clean slate, a new start, a fresh chance. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness. Now let us go and show that forgiveness to other people. Let your forgiving power rise within us so that we can forgive those who've cheated us, who've hurt us, who've abused us. Lord, let us release that forgiveness to them now. Let us let go of this bondage. Let us let go of our past. Let us let go of our shame. Let us let go of our sin. Let us let go of our addiction now, Lord. Let us let it go and let the power of your forgiveness wash us clean. And we thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made. We thank you that he alone broke the power of sin and death so that we can live in freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.
So one of the most profound things that I've ever thought of, and it's in the Bible, is that the creator of the whole universe gave his life for us. He gave his life for you. And you could have eternal life with him. And today, if you have given your life to him, if you have said, Lord, you are my savior. I believe in you and I trust in you. We want to encourage you to go to thrive.church slash info and put your information in there. And someone's going to reach out to you because we want to rejoice with you for giving your life to Jesus Christ. And also today, um, we know that it's a little bit weird with the social distancing that we have to do, but we're going to be doing something very soon on uh, groups. And if you go to thrive.church slash groups, we're going to get something together so that you could have your small groups and you could join with one another during the week and, and build each other up and help each other out in this difficult time. And we hope that you all just have a great day. God bless you. Keep safe. Keep healthy, and we'll see you next week.